And apropos bumper music, staying alive, since we want to talk a little bit about public health, uh, we have with us Jason Reed from Young Voices. He's the lead for the UK uh, Young Voices and a, become kind of a good friend and a Twitter buddy. Jason, are you there? How are you this morning, sir? Good morning. Yes, I'm here. I'm very well, thank you. It's lovely to be with you. How are you doing? Utterly relieved to hear you because we were a little worried about it. So thank you uh, so much for being with us. Uh, one thing that the general public has noticed uh, that maybe came out of the COVID stuff is they've kind of grown an awareness of what the World Health Organization is, what they do. More importantly, maybe things that they don't do that you would think they do and the funding and how that affects the things they do. And you've been writing a lot about that lately, haven't you? I have, yeah, and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, you're absolutely right, Andrew, that it's increased awareness of the World Health Organization as a body, uh, but the problem is that COVID has exposed all of their failures. It's exposed everything that they're doing wrong. An organization like the World Health Organization, what they should be doing, what they should be spending all their time doing is preparing for public health disasters, like, for example, a pandemic. But when the pandemic came around, it just exposed how unprepared they were and all kinds of other problems as well, which didn't get much attention beforehand, like the fact that they're cozying up so much to the Chinese Communist Party, which means that because the virus uh, originated in China, uh, we didn't get a lot of the data early on that we needed about that virus and how to fight it, which cost uh, goodness knows how many lives. And I'm sure that will come out in, uh, in future years as, as we investigate the origins of the COVID crisis and what cost so many lives. The problem is that they are spending all their time on other issues which they should not be spending their time on. They have become obsessed with lifestyle policing, and that's why you're seeing all these bonkers uh, proposals, well, not proposals, diktats issued by the World Health Organization on issues ranging from sugar taxes to salt taxes to food packaging, standardized food pa packaging and advertising restrictions for food to combat the so-called obesity crisis, limits on smoking, limits on vaping. They believe that women of childbearing age should not be consuming alcohol at all. They subscribe to this insane nanny statist worldview that any kind of indulgence in anything at all in your lifestyle is completely unacceptable and the state needs to crack down on it. And they are wielding a very worrying amount of influence when it comes to governments, lawmakers around the world. And the result is that when we have a crisis like COVID, they're not prepared for it. And in other areas, we are seeing all kinds of new nanny state measures which compromise civil liberties uh, and which are actively bad for public health outcomes. And one of the things before we get into the specifics of what they're doing is how is it that they weld power in the first place? Because we know they're, they're kind of a World Health Organization. That sounds impressive but they don't really have a whole lot of legal authority in sovereign countries, and yet they seem to weld immense power and authority over folks. So why is it that they're getting this kind of power and push? Is it just the government's going along with it and liking to use their banner so that they can kind of make them the bad guy and go, oh, the World Health Organization said this, it's not just us, that sort of thing? Yes, effectively. Well, first of all, there's the money aspect, but... Um we, lots of governments around the world fund the World Health Organization uh, to the tune of billions and billions of dollars every year. And, uh, and so we feel that we kind of have to get something in return for that. But a lot of it is just political maneuvering. You've got this, um, this group of elites, which is a closed shop, which doesn't accept anyone who disagrees with its received doctrine, with its received wisdom. Uh, and it just issues these thick caps to governments around the world. And when you have people within government, which is the case in every government, you have people who are more inclined to compromise civil liberties than to preserve them. People who are more inclined to uh, take action when they see what they perceive to be an issue in society, rather than allowing people or allowing the market to do what they think is best. When you have those people in government and you have this um, lauded organization called the World Health Organization, staffed by people with lots of letters after their name, telling you that it's vital that you implement all of these aggressive interventionist policies. It's an inevitable consequence that what's going to happen is that you're going to see the nanny state grow. And at very occasionally you have resistance to this. We've been very lucky uh, in my home country, in the United Kingdom, on some issues we've been good so far actually resisting the World Health Organization, and that's been brilliant for public health outcomes. 
But we're seeing the World Health Organization's influence is not shrinking. It is growing as time goes on, especially, as you say, as a result of increased awareness from the COVID pandemic. It means that when they issue their completely bonkers uh, diktats on all kinds of other areas of public health policy, that now it gets reported as this is what science is. This is what experts are saying. And so this is what it's common sense to do. There's no debate to be had here. And that's really, really dangerous. Jason Reed, Young Voices UK, joining us. He's also with the Consumer Choice Center, which a lot of folks uh, with this station are very familiar with. Uh, Jason, I, I cannot think of anything more counterproductive than having uh, health information or health dictates, as you call them, although you say it better in your accent than I do in my hillbilly. Um, <laughs> when you have one thing that you say, we're going to do something for somebody's public good or public health, and then you give them contradictory information, that automatically makes something not sound right to folks. And when it comes to this vaping and not smoking thing, I, it just boggles my mind. And I know it's antidotal incidents, and people probably have better stats than I do. But everybody I know that quits smoking through vaping just raves about it. And they just say, this is the only thing that ever got me off smoking was vaping. Maybe it's not as perfectly healthy as clean air, but shouldn't we just take the win there instead of trying to nanny state down the vaping and, st and just take the win? The way I see it, Andrew, is that we are moving organically to a smoke-free society anyway because so many people en masse have decided that they want to quit smoking. I think that's a good thing. I think that we all know that smoking uh, is harmful to your health. Uh, but the problem is that we've got these, these actors like the World Health Organization and like various health actors we've seen the FDA get involved in a very aggressive way recently um, who are trying to effectively make it more difficult for people who want to quit smoking to be able to do that, which, if you think about it, is completely the wrong way around because they say they want to be eradicating smoking, but then they also crack down on things like vaping and other reduced-risk products, um, which help tobacco harm reduction because they help people quit smoking. Vaping, electronic cigarettes, is by far the most effective method that's ever been discovered for helping people to quit smoking. It's much more effective than nicotine patches. It's certainly much more effective than going cold turkey. It's by far the most effective method ever. And yet, um, organizations like the FDA, at the behest of diktats from the World Health Organization, are looking to crack down on it because they see the word nicotine and they panic and they think, oh my goodness, we need to, um, we need to crack down on this straight away. They're giving in to the public health lobby, the people who fetishize the rolling back of civil liberties, and that's having disastrous effects on public health outcomes. For example, we're seeing that if you look at the polling numbers among smokers, very few of them actually know that vaping is much healthier than smoking, which it is. So many people are unaware of that, which is unsurprising, because this, this messaging that we're seeing, all the headlines that you see about vaping are negative, and they assure you that it's going to kill you and that they're, they're, it's a, as addictive as heroin and all this unscientific nonsense which gets thrown around, and the result is that people don't quit smoking in big enough numbers. And it's not just limited to vaping either. Even restrictions on, on smoking itself, um, which would seem perhaps to an anesthetist, would seem to be common sense if what you're trying to do is to eradicate smoking. But these kinds of policies that they always reach for, these tired 20th century taxes and bans, they don't work. If you look at the case of Australia, for example, Australia is a perfect case study for this because they were seeing a substantial decline, an organic decline in the number of smokers as more and more people decided that they wanted to quit and went ahead with it. Um, and then the government came along and introduced all of these interventionist policies. They had restrictions on sales and they had standardized packaging and they had uh, some of the highest tobacco taxes in the world. And all of a sudden, that decline in the number of smokers plateaued. It stalled completely because this kind of policy simply doesn't work. You cannot centralize people's lifestyle choices and uh, change their behavior through the state. It never works. And even if it did work, it, but encouraging people to vape would be a positive thing if what you actually care about is people's health because vaping is roughly 95% healthier than smoking. But this kind of warped thinking is completely illogical, as you can see from these uh, bodies like the World Health Organization, um, but that's because it's about control. It's not about 
public health. They just want us to have no freedoms at all. They want us to be living miserable lives where we all eat grey sludge, uh, and they will do whatever it takes to reach that point. He's Jason Reed, head of PR and UK lead at Young Voices and anti-gray sludge advocate. Uh, what's what's the balance here? Because we, we don't want to just rail against government all the time. Government obviously has a public health uh, interest for a lot of reasons, but we also want to talk about people's freedom of choice. How are we going to get a balance in a practical way between these governments, you, I think you put it well when you wrote about this. You said these things are ill thought out and slapdash approach to public health. How do we get a more consistent public health policy where folks at least know what the rules are and they make sense? Because, again, something like vaping and smoking, it just sounds contradictory to people and it makes them not want to believe the government when they need to have belief in them with things like COVID and other issues that are more serious. Yeah, this is, the, this is the problem. Well, the problem, as I see it, is short-termism, is we have this culture within government that politicians come into government and they want to be seen to make a splash. They want to have favorable headlines about, oh, look at all the good things I'm doing to crack down on this and that, and I'm saving an entire generation of people. And then they leave their post as a lawmaker and they go and rake it in in the private sector. And meanwhile, the long-term effect of whatever slapdash policy they've introduced that they haven't thought out properly uh, is detrimental for the citizens of that country. Um, if you look at the Australia case, for example, that's exactly what happened. The long-term effect showed up the flaws with the policy, but the politicians don't care about that because the politicians only care about what happens in the immediate term and what happens for their polling numbers and what happens when the next election rolls around. And so the, the solution, the only solution, as I see it, is that the government needs to roll back its stake in public health and allow the market to take control. And what that means in the case of vaping and smoking is that, as we're seeing in huge numbers, people are aware of uh, the, the dangers of smoking because we have a free market for information. And so they are using that information when they have it to quit smoking using reduced risk products like vaping, like electronic cigarettes and like other products like snooze and heat not burn tobacco products. Um, that's what happens when you allow people to make their own choices. But the problem is that we never reach that point a lot of the time because the governments around the world are so certain that people are stupid and they need to be guided, they need a guiding hand to tell them what to do, and that if you leave them alone, they will make the worst possible choices for, your, for their health, and that has to be stopped. Right. Jason Reed, uh, one last question for you. We talk about this. Uh, it seems to be universal, but uh, why, why is it a government response to everything to try to, what's the word we want to use here? I would say probably patronizing. I would say infantilizing sometimes. They really want to treat us like children, and oftentimes the government's acting more childish or more immature or without a lack of restraint than the general public is. Uh, what do you think the best recourse is? Is it advocacy? Is it democratic process? What do you think we can actually do about this? Well, what we can do is um, to make our voice heard to our to lawmakers and point out the fact that what they're doing by cracking down on vaping is makes no sense at all. So write to your representative and sign petitions and things like that. Um, but when it comes to attitudes, I think it's just the case that if you go into government and you go in on a platform of, I'm going to solve all your problems for you, the necessary implication of that is that there are problems that need to be solved that people want to solve, but they're unable to solve by themselves. It's this kind of mentality that uh, people, as you say, people need to be infantilized, they need to be patronized, they need to be talked down to. And that's just, uh, that's just what happens when you have a culture of government like we have, where the government thinks it is its right to solve our problems for us. And that's why this is such a dangerous, slippery slope, because once you've got that belief in the heads of people who make our laws and who govern our countries, then that's a very, very difficult belief to extract from there, because they're so certain that what they're doing is vital and that no one could possibly disagree, and that anyone who disagrees must have an ulterior motive. And so it becomes so strong that even when it's unscientific, even when you can point at a graph and say, look, here is the harm, here is the active harm that your policies are causing. Even then, they are so blinded, they are so narrow-minded, they are so certain that what they're doing is right that they won't listen to any opposing view. 
Jason Reed, he's the head of PR and UK lead at Young Voices, who we partner with frequently on this show, and I do personally. Uh, he writes about public health and civil liberties. Tell folks where they can find you and follow your work, my friend. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Jason Reed 624 I post everything on there, probably too much. <laughs> no such thing. You great, bring great information. Thank you so much for your time calling us from England today. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Really glad to be with you. Thank you, sir. We'll take a quick break. We went along with Jason, but we wanted to with good information. TK defiantly waving his cigarettes over his head that you will get out of his cold, dead hand. We will take a break and be right back after this. 